All right, everyone, we're going to get started with our food for thought today. More access, more options. It's time to remove outdated delegation barriers for APRNs. Just to get started, um, I know most of you guys are familiar with us, but we are the Texas Association of Health Plans, and we represent private health insurance companies, commercial health insurance, Medicaid managed care companies, and Medicare Advantage companies in the state of Texas. So if you ever have any questions about coverage, healthcare issues, um, please know you can always contact any of us. Um, I have our phone numbers on here and our email addresses. And just to really get started real quick, I'm gonna let Jason and Lori say hello. Hi everybody. Hey everyone, if you have any Medicaid or CHIP questions, you know, always feel free to reach out. Thanks for joining us today. All right. Now, um, I'm going to introduce our um, three participants today in our conversation. So first, we've got Amy Anderson. She's a visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation focusing on healthcare policy. She recently served as an expert counsel at the National Coronavirus Recovery Commission for COVID-19. And she is, um, and Dr. Anderson is a professor at Harris College of Nursing and Health Science Centers at TCU here in Texas. Um, and a professor in healthcare policy and advocacy theme lead for the School of Medicine at TCU. Um, we're really excited to have her here today to talk about this issue with us. And next we've got Erin Cusack, who works with the Texas Nurse Practitioners Association here in Texas. Um, and she formerly served as a policy analyst for State Representative Eddie Rodriguez here in Austin, Texas. And last but not least, we've got Blake Hudson um, with AARP. I know many of you guys are familiar with his work um, really coming up with a solution around surprise billing. And this is one of his, there are many issues that they're working on to really um, improve access to care for Texans. And as you guys know, I'm Jamie Dudensing and I'm the CEO of the association. All right. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Amy to let her get started on her presentation. Thank you. Let me get my screen shared here. I'm looking forward to being, I'm happy to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm going to present on the national picture on healthcare workforce and uh, the shortages that we're facing, as well as some lessons that we've learned from the pandemic here over the last uh, year. So let's get started. Um, as you all know, we're facing workforce shortages and some of our challenges are related to an aging population. Um, we've got adults 65 and older outnumbering kids by 2034. So that's a significant shift in our age um, overall here in the United States. And that means more elderly, more chronic disease. And at this point in time, about six in 10 adults have a chronic disease. And we've noted that in the pandemic that that's made a significant impact on hospitalizations. Um, and most of our healthcare dollars are going towards chronic disease and mental illness. We also have a problem with what we call disproportionate ratios. So we've got a lot, about 70% of physicians are choosing a specialty over primary care. Um, and that's creating that disproportionate uh, ratio. And, and we found that um, through studies that uh, co uh, countries that have primary workforce heavy physicians, lots of physicians in primary workforce, help have really helped the outcomes for primary care um, services. So when we've got patients that are going to preventive services, they're doing well long term and their outcomes are a lot better. If you have a country that's got a good proportionate proportion of primary care physicians versus specialties. So we have too many. We have too many specialties, specialists right now in healthcare that are physicians, and that's problematic long term for our outcomes for our US citizens. And then about 10% of physicians are choosing to work in rural locations. And that's really created a maldistribution of providers. So we've got a lot of physicians working in urban locations and suburban locations. And the state of Texas really has a high portion of counties that are rural, and that's problematic long-term. We're also noting that we have an aging workforce and faculty members, both at the School of Medicines and, and as well as the School of Nursing, and also just healthcare workforce in general. Um, our average age of medical school faculty is somewhere between 50 and 59. 
We're also seeing issues with early retirements coming uh, with stress and burnout and fatigue already from healthcare reform. And now with the pandemic, we've added an additional layer of problem there on individuals considering um, you know, retiring early. Um, and we're also predicting about 37% of states have a projected primary care shortage by 2025, which is really soon. <laughs> so we've got to come up with solutions on how we can manage that and ensure that our, our citizens, our constituents have access to the kind of care that they need. And we've also noted in the pandemic that those provided shortages, as well as with just any chronic disease, we're seeing increased morbidity and more mortality for people in rural America. Part of the reason that physicians are choosing specialties over primary care is this primary care income gap. And you'll see a noted there on the, uh, the table. There's a significant difference in yearly salary as well as lifetime earnings, millions of dollars in lifetime earnings difference. And with students coming out with major medical uh, debt from going to school, from going to a school of medicine, a lot of them are shifting their focus to specialties once they graduate. And that again is creating an issue with the number of primary care doctors that we have. Our, the predicted shortage is anywhere between about 62,000 to 95,000. I've heard higher by 2030. So it's just gonna depend on things, how things fall out and whether retirements are coming very quickly after the pandemic ends. We've also not paid, we've outpaced our graduate medical education spaces in the hospitals. So that's creating sort of that a barrier and a backlog of students trying to get into GME slots. Um, so another issue that educational pipeline cannot produce the number of physicians that we are gonna need by 2030. We've also seen an increase in paperwork and regulations through the reform process. Um, so the legislature uh, nationally has put into in more uh, barriers to that direct one-on-one -on -one care with a patient. And those minutes are really important because it, it impacts um, how, many, how many can be on a patient panel and how much time a, a physician or provider can, sh and can spend with a patient. So these are things that, that we're looking at nationally and are certainly um, something to consider in Texas as well. On the graphic to your left, you're gonna note uh, with the supply and demand, the supply is really not meeting the demand. And when you look at 2025, we, we are going to have some significant problems. I know right now, even for myself, if I try to get into just to, to do a well exam, it can take up to six weeks just to make an appointment. That's going to continue to get worse and worse over the time period um, as we get closer to um, 2025, 2030. So things to consider. Some lessons that we learned from the pandemic were certainly that we have excessive regulations and that really did slow pan our pandemic response at all levels of government, whether it was local, regional, state, or national. And that regulatory reform is essential to, to a sustain sustained response here that we've had to uh, accommodate changes and regulations in order to both uh, give access to patients as well as to help it hopefully improve our economic situation. Long-term, there has been obviously a critical disrupt disruption in medical training. For us uh, at the medical school that I teach at, we are um, on doing most of our work online with the students. So they're, they, they're doing well, but we don't know long-term how that's gonna impact um, their knowledge and uh, how they're gonna do long-term within their residency. Are we gonna meet what they needed uh, within that? We project that we will, but we don't know for sure. And that's for all healthcare professionals. Many of the, the practicum or the clinical hours that they've had to do have been, had to be uh, either telehealth or Zoom related rather than in-person. And so that's modified um, what we can and can't do with patients. There's also those layoffs and furloughs that happened at the beginning of the, the pandemic um, really did exacerbate some concerns with the workforce maintenance long-term, um, whether or not that uh, pushed people out and whether they returned back to their workplace or not. We're, we're, we're looking at that now as we're seeing you know, the increasing number of COVID patients in the hospitals, um, that, that, that displacement, um, really had an impact on workforce, the stress, um, concerns with what they what individuals wanted to do long term. So we're seeing field changes when it comes to personnel, um, whether retirements are coming and how we're going to end up dealing with the displacement that has occurred from the pandemic. We also again noted, as I mentioned before, that chronic disease management is an essential piece of healthcare. It's expensive. Um, it also has 
We, we now know how significant it is when we've got an infectious disease. In this particular one, it really impacted individuals with chronic disease much more heavily than those that are healthy. So we've got to figure out how to reduce health disparities. disparities. And what we've known from studies and research is uh, advanced practice nurses and other healthcare providers like physicians assistants are great at chronic disease management and they also reduce cost. So some economic considerations is that we are definitely going to have a pandemic recession um, with the, the type of interventions that we've done already nationally as well within states with PPP and that sort of thing. There are going to be budget shortfalls and we've got to figure out how uh, as a country as well as, as each individual state are going to deal with that budget fallout from the pandemic. There are recommendations across the board to codify the regulatory changes that happened during the pandemic to prove to further improve access and, and you know, decrease costs long-term. We were seeing that you know, physicians were having to go between states, nurses were having to go between states. Um, many states went ahead and relaxed those that had barriers to APRM practice, relaxed those regula regulations, and many are now codifying those to ma maintain those long-term. So something for Texas certainly to consider. Um, and you might have no noted uh, several years ago, the Federal Trade Commission came out with a letter on the competitive harm of placing barriers to AP on practice by, by having those, that supervision by a physician that really it's an anti-competitive problem. And that in order to improve market conditions, we really need to remove those barriers to increase both access uh, choice as well as decreasing cost um, in locations. This also, this idea also supports innovation and entrepreneurship from a business perspective. Uh, there are studies that show that states that do release those barriers, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, um, you're getting more tax revenue from uh, businesses like APRN uh, practices and clinics. And just in general, we have to create a new vision for an efficient and cost-effective care delivery system. So we're calling it TAP of licensed care. Um, as physicians are, as we're evolving in science and medicine, we're also evolving the amount of knowledge and technology that an individual who's working in the field has to know. So we need physicians working at the top of their license, nurse practitioners working at the top of their licenses. Um, you know, nurses working at the top of their license, respiratory therapists doing the same thing. We need everybody working at the height of their knowledge and education in order to provide that more cost efficient system. So some national studies, and I think you'll end up getting these slides so you can look at them a little bit more closely, but some national studies that have come out are showing just cost savings, cost savings across the board when states are implement the system where you know they remove those barriers to APR in practice. So Medicaid costs decrease with full practice authority. 17% lower outpatient costs, a decrease in pre prescription drug costs across the board. Medicare, patients assigned to APRNs, cost of care 30% lower. Medicare estimated savings $44 billion. An American Enterprise Institute study, cost of care lower with all the different variables. Um, a six to 7% lower cost for complex VA patients. Um, Urban Institute, Institute said savings of $11.8 million per 100,000 births for midwifery clinics, a 40, $472 million estimated state savings for retail clinics nationwide. And then looking at from a pediatric perspective, those ant removing those barriers brings costs down about three to 16% for pediatric well child visits. So across the board nationally, the studies are showing that this is gonna make an, a significant economic difference um, and will help us long-term, especially with these, this pandemic recession that we're seeing and those healthcare dollars being precious in the states as well as nationally, determining how to allocate those dollars effectively and safely. Um, nurse practitioners, the studies are showing safety is not an issue. They provide quality of care. Individuals get to make that choice about whether they want to see a nurse practitioner or a physician, and many are choosing nurse practitioners and, and um, and without a problem long-term. So from a state perspective, some of the, the studies are showing, you know, these are just numbers. In Alabama, they're saying $729 million over 10 years for their budget. California, $1.8 billion in preventive care alone. Florida, Medicaid savings of seven to $44 million. And the, the list goes on and on. So many, there are many studies out there done by very ret reputable sources showing the cost savings exists. And then this is an economic boom for the states from a revenue perspective, as well as for a cost saving perspective within the budget. The budget. 
Some recent poly policy recommendations have come out, the Global Think Tank Town Hall, the Lauder Institute, remove regulatory barriers on non-physician providers. Uh, a new healthcare reform plan that was just put out on the conservative side um, that will be uh, talked about probably in midterm elections and certainly is available now to look at, remove those barriers, provide, you know, provide dis anything that's discouraging competition, remove the barriers, anything that interferes with access to care. And the National Coronavirus Recovery Commission also talked about this in their guidelines and findings uh, through the pandemic to remove those barriers, remain, you know, keep that durable policy reforms so that we can have a sustained recovery. And as the president of the Heritage Foundation said, any good public health policy is good economic policy. So here are some resources for you. Uh, if you want to look at them, I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Here is also my contact information. I'm happy to speak with any of you at any point. So thank you for having me. And I'll hand it over to Erin. Wonderful, and thank you, Amy, um, so much for, for laying that groundwork in the background. Um, some really interesting stuff happening as we're studying and learning about this in the context of the pandemic. So let me go ahead and, and share my screen so I can kind of follow up on how this issue really impacts Texas and what we are currently advocating for during the 87th legislative session to really address how some of the regulatory burdens um, at, specifically as they impact APRNs and, and how we can expand access to care. So my goal this morning is if I can convince you that um, making the beer to go waivers permanent is, is just as important or just as cool as, as healthcare and removing the red tape to healthcare, I will be super pleased. Um, we know this is everyone's favorite COVID waiver, but there are some other waivers, especially in healthcare and, and specifically for COVID that, that we think are equally as exciting. And it's really at the end of the day, it's about really kind of now that we've ripped a lot of the sheets off of the problem, we've seen how we can do business more efficiently and more effectively. Um, we can take a, a better look at these regulations that we've had in place for a long time, particularly in healthcare, and, and see how we can improve them, which ones actually have, have value for consumers or for patients and which ones are just really getting in the way of, of patients and providers and Texans. Um, and, and we think our issue is, is one of those. Um, so what we're currently advocating for is uh, removing delegation requirements for APRNs or advanced practice nurses. And this is a really hot topic, not just in Texas, but nationally, there's been a huge movement on doing this really for the past 10 years. And even within the past couple years, we've seen quite a few states make these changes in, in their laws. Um, but the reason why we think this is important for this session and for the moment we find ourselves in is this is one of the few healthcare policy solutions that both improves access to care and has the ability to, to reduce healthcare costs. There's very, very few things on the table that can do that. And, and this is one of those policy solutions. It also just improves the general business environment in Texas. It makes it easier to hire, recruit, retain healthcare providers. It just makes sense for, for patients and businesses. But backing up a step, um, for those of you who are getting lost in the alphabet soup, maybe you know what an APRN is. You've been seeing an NP for, for a long time now, but um, APRN stands for Advanced Practice Registered Nurse. There's four roles within that, nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialist, uh, certified registered nurse anesthetist, and midwives. And there's now well over 30,000 APRNs in Texas. They have a really, really particular role in primary care. <clears throat> and the vast majority of APRNs are NPs. That's the most common one. And 80% of them currently are licensed in an area of primary care. Something important to, to know about APRNs, um, just in, in terms of background and education, every Texas APRN is a nurse first. So they were a bedside nurse. They spent years and hours at the bedside learning patient care um, in, in a clinical practice. Um, and then they decide to go back to school and they have to either have a graduate degree or a doctorate is increasingly the norm, pass a national board certification exam, 
and they go through a licensing process with the Board of Nursing. And this is every APRN in Texas. Their scope um, is very different than that the scope of a physician. It's more narrowly defined. Um, they don't spend as much time in residency because they're not doing rot rotations in every single floor in every single department. They're not doing surgery. So from the very beginning of their graduate program, they choose a field like family primary care or women's health or um, mental health. And they specialize in that area and they are board certified in that area. So something really important to kind of know in the back of your mind about APRNs. Um, also, when we're talking about delegation requirements and we'll, we'll dig into the, the weeds of that in just a bit, it doesn't in any way change or alter scope for APRNs. So if we were to pass the bill we're advocating for tomorrow an APRN wouldn't do anything differently than what they're currently doing today. They would just be doing so without the requirement in Texas law for a, a delegation agreement. Um, so what is delegation? What does that even mean? What is this delegation barrier that we keep talking about over and over again? Um, in, in Texas law, um, every APRN, even after they graduate from their program, they pass their boards, they have their license, um, they still cannot practice as a nurse practitioner or an APRN. They have to kind of jump through an additional hoop. In order to practice, they have to enter into a contractual agreement, what we call a delegation agreement with the physician. Um, and since 2013, um, in Texas law, we don't really require a whole lot other than the contract. Um, we, the physician doesn't have to be in the same practice or even the same city as the APRN. They don't have to provide direct care to the APRN's patients or sign off on the care that the APRN is providing. Really, the only requirement in Texas law is that they meet once a month to discuss patient care for care that was delivered in the past. Um, so very, very kind of minimal requirements and we've been operating under this framework since 2013. So what we really have is just this artifact of, of the delegation agreement, but it's not clear what the value is for the patient and it definitely does not translate to what most of us would think of when we think of real-time supervision or real-time uh, direct oversight. That, that has not been a requirement in Texas law or in most states for a very, very long time. So who supports removing this requirement? Um, as I said, this is a really hot topic in Texas, but there's been momentum building on this issue for, for years. Um, now 31 states and the District of Columbia have removed these requirements. Um, most recently, California and Florida just this year passed legislation to, to remove the requirement for delegation. Um, I think there's many reasons they decided to do it this year. There was questions related to Medicaid expansion and needing to improve access to care on that front. There was also pandemics to deal with, uh, but those are two very large states with huge healthcare uh, markets and industries. So they move forward with this. Also the military and all three branches, or all three branches of the military and the VA have had this in place for a long time. So this is not a new policy idea or a new policy concept. It's been tried and tested, it's worked. And I think it's important to note that not a single state has reversed this policy or found that there were any negative outcomes after moving forward with, with removing the delegation agreement. For those states who still have a delegation requirement, um, there was another kind of interesting policy experiment that we observed over the past year. 19 states, including Texas during COVID, temporarily waived delegation requirements in some form or fashion for APRNs. Um, so I think a lot of states will be looking at this as their legislative sessions reconvene is did this work? Was this effective for us? And, and we hope Texas is one of those states because again, all the states who haven't already made this change experimented with that during the, the pandemic with, with good outcomes. Who supports this issue? So this is really, I think, where you can see that this is something that is widely supported, has bipartisan support. Um, you have organizations like the Texas Association of Health Plans, which in the Texas Association of Business, you also have your traditional healthcare stakeholders. Torch is concerned about this issue because of the need for access to care in rural and community hospitals 
AARP because of the aging population that we have in Texas, and the list goes on and on and on. So this is truly, um, we think of it not as, as a, a scope issue, and it's, it's not a turf war, which is often how it can be presented or perceived in the Texas legislature. It's really um, a business issue, a consumer issue, an access issue, and it's just kind of the right thing to do for Texas patients. And I think this list of supporters really, really illustrates that, and, and it's growing every day, um, the organizations who sign on. So why should you care about this barrier and why is it particularly problematic in Texas? We pride ourselves on being a state that is really, really good for doing business. We're attractive for businesses. People wanna move here. People are moving here in droves, but we are uh, consistently ranked one of the 10 worst states to be a nurse practitioner. And it really is because of some of this bureaucratic red tape and, and some of the regulations surrounding how we license and allow them to work here. Um, that's really not a distinction that I think we want to have. Um, just to give you an example of that, this year during COVID, many, many providers switched or pivoted to telemedicine or telehealth or it started incorporating telemedicine or telehealth into their practices for the first time. We also saw some great waivers that gave providers additional flexibility to use telehealth for those who couldn't come in person to their offices. When we polled our members this year um, during COVID, we asked them, okay, would you consider practicing telemedicine outside of the state of Texas. And 80% of our members said that both during COVID and after they would consider providing telemedicine outside of Texas. And that is because they can do that without a delegation requirement in those other states. And they're more free to provide telemedicine care to patients in other states than it, they are right here in their home state. That is really um, a waste of your healthcare provider workforce. Those are resources that we should be dedicating to Texans. A perfect example of this is mental health nurse practitioners. Um, they're oftentimes practicing telemedicine in other states because it's just too onerous to, to meet the requirements here in Texas. It's, it's something we really need to look at and, and address. We also poll our members consistently every year and ask them, how much are you paying for your delegation agreement? Because this isn't just, it's not just administrative waste and time. It also comes with a, a real concrete cost, either for the employer of the NP or it's a direct out of pocket cost for the nurse practitioner if, they're, if they have their own clinic. So the range is anywhere from $5,000 to $87,000 a year that nurse practitioners are paying for these agreements, which again, is not actual care. It's just to kind of check that, that regulatory box that you're complying with Texas law. Um, and that this is a hidden tax on healthcare. It is passed on to consumers. This is money that would be better spent on actually providing vital services to patients and in areas where those services are, are needed most. Um, one thing that I think is really important to, to highlight is the what our primary care workforce currently looks like and what we expect for the future. So we were actually a, a little bit shocked when we looked at the numbers here, but there's about 22,000 physicians in primary care in Texas and there are 20,000 nurse practitioners in primary care. So this is really currently half of the primary care workforce that we have at our disposal. We have 7 million Texans living in primary care shortage areas, and that number just keeps going up every year. So when we have half of our primary care workforce not working to the top of their license, as Amy says, or not working um, as they could otherwise if it was a better regulatory environment, that's really Texas's loss, and, and we need to really think about that. And it's not just the current situation, it's also what we project for the future. We saw the national numbers on trends in physicians and other healthcare providers and they're going into specialties. That is not the case for nurse practitioners. Right now, 80.5% uh, of NPs are specializing in an area of, of primary care. And that number actually is on the rise, whereas we see that there is a decline in the number of physicians who are specializing in primary care. Uh, the National Academy of Family Physicians 
recently reported that only 8.6% of physician graduates were matched to primary care residencies. That is not going to be a number that's going to meet the need here in Texas. So it's not just about who is our current workforce and, and are we utilizing them to, to the, the top of their license, but also what, what is the future of the primary care workforce look like and what are the future needs of primary care here in Texas? And that's going to be a really important question. Um, this is something when we're looking at what do we expect to see if we remove this requirement? What are some of the outcomes we expect to see for, for access? And this is an analysis from a health insurance company and they looked at primary care shortage areas before we make this change and after we make this change. And you can see the before and after maps, the primary care shortage literally you flip a switch overnight and just by changing one policy, a policy that doesn't cost you any money, um, you improve access to care overnight. So this is really one of those things when you're talking about, okay, how can we expand access and how can we expand coverage, which is a really important uh, conversation this session as well. It, it's about um, having the healthcare provider workforce that can actually meet the need and see these patients. And this is one of the solutions that can, that can contribute towards that outcome. We also know that it's going to expand access in rural areas. And we've got a, a huge swath of the state that, that this impacts, but in the, there was an article in the, the Journal of the American Medical Association that showed trends and patterns in how we're seeing physicians and nurse practitioners move in and out of, in, of rural areas. And nurse practitioners are now um, really increasing in those areas. And that trend is, is on, on the rise. So if we want to improve access to care this in rural communities, this is a great way to do this. It's one of many ways, but it, it's a tool that we have in our toolkit. So um, more access, more options. Let's go back to that first slide where we were talking about that this policy has the ability to improve access, decrease costs, and better quality. Let's look at that in more concrete terms. So in states that have removed the delegation requirement um, or who have not, I, I misspoke there, it, they see 40% uh, less primary care nurse practitioners. So that is, that is significant. The cost savings, when we're looking at states that have recently adopted this, like Florida, they did an internal analysis and they found that they could save their state $44 million in annual Medicaid savings if they remove this delegation requirement. And that's for a lot of reasons, but we certainly have a lot of savings on the table for the Medicaid program here in Texas, not to mention improving network adequacy with those populations. And you also see better quality. So when you're talking about things like decreased hospitalizations, readmissions, emergency department visits, when you improve access to APRNs and you remove unnecessary red tape, you see improved patient outcomes in those areas, which again can also lead to, to savings for the entire healthcare system. So this is really producing results for states. And, and we think that, that this is something that Texas should really consider as it's looking at how to address an ongoing pandemic, as well as how to ad address things like a budgetary shortfall or ways to improve access within our Medicaid chip system in particular. Um, but with that, I'll go ahead and, and stop sharing my screen and happy to, to answer any questions you may have. All right, um, let's get everybody back on. I was gonna say we're starting to get some questions. Um, for everyone that is on, if you have a question, um, please write it into the Q&A box or you know, please feel free to um, add it in. Make sure we're on here. Um, Blake, are you on? Yep, I'm here. Okay. Make sure we're on the gallery view. All right, um, so we do have a question in the chat box about, you know, I think we've talked about the, the delegation contract. You guys both mentioned it, that it has a significant cost to it. It could be really expensive. You know, what, um, and maybe Blake can help with this, you know, what are the average amounts that nurse practitioners are seeing for this delegation contract? And what do those dollars really mean when you're, when you're comparing it to their, you know, their business and how much they make? Sure. So uh, Aaron talked about a survey that they did of their members, and there is a study that came out in 2019 that really mirrored that and found that 
the contracts typically cost $6,000, but can be um, much, much more than that. And I think what's important to also point out is that, um, so in a hospital setting, for example, that contract's gonna get added to the, uh, that cost is gonna get added to the contract for the physicians that work there to also have this as part of the responsibility. So sort of adds to the system there, but where it really gets bad is where we most need that additional primary care. And that is in our rural and underserved areas. And what the same study found was that a rural uh, a nurse practitioner led clinic is six times more likely to have to pay um, these really high costs for these agreements. And that's really where we need the, the care most um, in Texas is both in our rural and in our underserved areas. You know, and I will, so I'll talk about this. So we got a question here from um, in the Q and A to add on to that, you know, is this, is really just removing this fee or this contract, the only real policy change that we're talking about here as compared to changes in scope of practice? Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to take that one. Um, it, it really is just changing those contractual requirements. In 2013, that's, that's the last time we tackled this issue in Texas. We removed requirements for on-site physician supervision. Um, we, were, we removed requirements that physicians had to be within a certain mile radius of, of the PA or APRM that they delegate to. So really all that was left was this requirement that you have to enter into the delegation agreement and that you meet once a month to discuss patient care that was delivered in the past. That's all we have. So I, I think oftentimes people have the concept, okay, this is, this is supervision, this is real oversight, but, but it hasn't been that way for a long time, not in Texas, not in most states. And, and it's not practical because there's also, everyone has their own panel of patients and sees their own patients and no one is able to typically see two patients um, at, at once or, or take their patients and another provider's patients. So it, it really is that, that contractual requirement which takes time uh, for both the physician and the APRN, it costs money and it delivers no value for, for patients. And so Amy, just kind of expand on that. You know, when you've seen this happen in other states, we talk about, more, you know, 31 other states have eliminated this barrier. Um, what have you seen as far as positive, you know, parts of that? And also, can you speak to the fact of, you know, has there been any negative impact as they removed that delegation barrier? So I haven't seen any negative impact um, nationally from removing of that uh, contract. It's really just an unnecessary contract. And I think when people think of supervision, they're thinking someone's standing behind you, watching what you're doing, telling you what to do if you're doing something wrong from a like, supervisor. That's not what's happening. And as Aaron mentioned, this really is a contract. So it's a business contract. And anything that's discussed at that monthly meeting would be in retrospect. So a change you might make in retrospect, it's not happening right now. So, so there's, there's, no, there's nothing that I can point to or have seen that there's been a negative impact. There continues to be quality care provided, increased access uh, options and choice for consumers, um, you know, allowing nurse practitioners to practice in the state they want to practice in. Because I know in Texas, certainly some of the nurse practitioners have moved or are crossing state lines to work out of state because the, the onerous burden of the contract and the cost. So, so I think this is a, you know, it's a sound policy. Um, it is not gonna make a, a huge difference in um, decision-making at the point of care um, because those decisions are made. And, and, you know, physicians are not involved in the education of nurse practitioners or vice versa. And so nurse practitioners, you know, I've taught in nurse practitioner programs and obviously teach in a medical program. And they're very different types of programs, but as Erin mentioned, they're focused. So nurse practitioners are focused on a specific area of medicine. So they're experts in that focused area. So they don't need that supervision. So that's um, really what we're seeing across the board is that the quality of care and the safety is there. And so this is just something that can be removed that, you know, takes another regulation, that red tape out and affects cost all over the place. So whether it's a hospital system having to pay those physicians for that contract, um, a healthcare plan, you know, or the individual nurse practitioner having to make that payment 
it's a hidden cost as Aaron mentioned and unnecessary. And then I'll take a stab at answering this next question. There was a question about whether a bill has been filed this session or to watch related, you know, these regulations to watch out for a bill. And I would say we are expecting legislation to be filed on this. It has been filed in the past. I think the real difference of where we're at right now is in, from previous sessions is that, you know, prior to COVID-19, we already had more than 7 million Texans living in a primary care shortage area. We had more than 15 million Texans living in a behavioral health shortage area, and we already knew we had a problem. You know, as we moved through this crisis, other states and our state, you know, through these waivers have become aware of just how important it is to get rid of the red tape and regulations that are hurting access to care. And it, we need to cut, you know, and remove those regulations to make sure patients have more options to care, whether, and, you know, I think this was brought up, you know, when states have eliminated delegation barriers, they've increased access, not just to rural areas, but also to the Medicaid population, to the uninsured population in underserved areas in urban areas. So we have huge access to care issues that this can solve without a single cent being paid for it. Um, now, Blake, I'm gonna ask you this question because I think it's a broader one about what are the primary hurdles being faced this legislative session that are hindering the expansion of rural health care? Um, I would definitely say this is one of them, but would you, could you kind of expand on that some more for us? Yeah, so I think that, you know, there's a whole package of things that need to be looked at from, um, from what can we do to, to make telehealth um, more of an option in rural areas, and some of that gets into access to high-speed internet, uh, rural broadband, you'll hear about that, but this is an important one. We know that um, research tells us that in states that have uh, lifted these barriers for APRNs, um, APRNs are more likely to go work in rural areas. Um, so there's a, there's a lot we can do right here. There's, you know, uh, I'll say it, there's a lot of talk around um, coverage expansion, whether that's Medicaid or something else. And one thing I always like to point out is no matter what you do on coverage expansion, someone has to care for these folks. Um, so whether we have coverage expansion or not, these people still need care and they need people that are willing to go work in these, um, in these underserved and rural areas uh, to, to provide that care. All right, and then um, we've got one more question. And I don't know if anyone else has questions, please you know, add them into the Q&A before we start to slow down um, and end the webinar. But this last question is, is um, and I, I'll probably have to rely on Aaron and Amy some for this, but could you touch on how this relates to out-of-state APRNs trying to get a license in Texas? Do they have the same regulations or even more? It's a great question. Um, and. And the pandemic has really revealed a lot of the issues with um, licensure between states, as well as things like telemedicine and how that's regulated state by state by state. And because of the regulatory waivers that we've had in relief, providers have been able to have flexibility and really meet the need where they're needed most. But um, no, if, if uh, outside of the pandemic, outside of what we have now, because we have waivers, an APRN cannot come from out of state and come to practice here without meeting this requirement. So they would have to find a delegating physician. They would have to enter into a delegation agreement. The business that hires or employs them would have to facilitate that process. And it makes it more difficult for hospitals, for health systems, for practices, for telemedicine companies to, to bring those providers here. It's, it's a huge burden. Your APRN license cannot be carried across borders. It's the same thing with telemedicine. Um, a, a nurse practitioner cannot, here in Texas, can provide telemedicine in another state if they don't have delegation requirements in that state, um, but they can't provide it here if they don't have a delegation, delegation agreement or a delegating physician. So these are really huge, huge barriers. If, when we're talking about licensure portability and expanding telemedicine and making it easier for, for providers to meet the need, all of these requirements get in the way of, of providers and patients. And so I think that it's re that living through this pandemic has really opened up our eyes to that reality. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that when we look at some of these waivers this session, it's something that we consider in the mix because the APRN regulatory issue is a huge part of that picture. 
And we have another question. I know we've kind of talked about the rural issue, but it's really kind of expanding on the effects to rural areas in Texas. And I think it um, it might be helpful to answer that question almost with an anecdotal story of what you've heard of the experience of a nurse practitioner, you know, practicing in a rural area and or attempting to try to expand or move to a rural area for practice and, and how this kind of barrier gets in the way um, of them being able to increase access to care. Let me add just a little bit there. So I think it's important for folks to realize that there are nurse practitioner led clinics in rural areas all over the state right now. So those nurse practitioners have gone out to areas where there aren't any physicians set up practices. Um, I think of one up in the panhandle that um, serves a population of uh, uh, a Medicaid population up there um, at, a, at a place called Boys Ranch where, where kids go. Um, and there's no physicians that, that treat those, those children. There's uh, a nurse practitioner like clinic. And, but that, that clinic is contingent on having a physician that's willing to enter into a contract. Physician never comes on site, doesn't provide any care for those, those, um, those patients, but you have to have that contract. So if the contract goes away overnight, you wake up and, and, and you can't provide that care. And that actually has happened in the past, but it's not just in the panhandle. There's a, there's a, um, a woman that runs a clinic in Badias, Texas, if anyone represents that area. And um, she's the only game in town. Um, again, physicians not come on site to the clinic, doesn't see the patients. It's a retrospective um, contractual agreement and it really doesn't add to anything. And so I, I'm always sort of impressed that these nurse practitioners and other APRNs have managed to figure out these contracts and open up these clinics, even with all the barriers the state has put in place. And it makes me sort of think, well, what could we really do if we remove the barriers? All right, I think we've got, we do have a little bit of a tougher question about, you know, what are the voice and position of primary care physicians? I think that might be hard for us to speak to completely since um, we do not represent them. Um, but I will say that, you know, generally they have been opposed to these types of um, eliminating these types of barriers. Um, but I would say, you know, as, as we've moved through trying to expand access and protect Texas patients over the years, we've seen similar, you know, types of turf battles. You know, we saw it with um, eliminating regulations for telemedicine and that same type of opposition, you know, and after we made it through the session and worked through the issues. You know, now we've all seen how, what a benefit it was that we took advantage of that in 2017 because we were set up and ready to go for COVID-19 um, to be able to make sure individuals in Texas had access to telemedicine. We saw the same type of opposition when we dealt with creating a prohibition on surprise billing in the state of Texas, you know, and now we've worked through that. Congress has also passed a similar prohibition, and, you know, and Texas patients are protected and, you know, everything's okay. So I would say, and, and I'll let Aaron or um, Amy kind of answer this too, but, you know, practitioners have a great relationship with physicians and they work with them all of the time. I think it's important to remember that this does not expand scope. It's just this contract that requires those practitioners to have to pay substantial dollars for not really any value um, in Texas for this. Um, but in the end, it's about patients, right? It's about giving patients more options and more access to care that they currently don't have. We have so many people moving to Texas and we already have such huge shortages of providers in the state of Texas that we really should be taking advantage of every option we have to make sure patients have the op options and access they need for valuable health care. You know, Erin, do you want to touch on it some? Yeah, and I think that's that's absolutely right. Um, and I think I would also want to add, you know, there's physicians have a really valuable role in the healthcare system, and APRNs are not substitutes and they don't replace physicians. Everyone has a role to play in the healthcare team to meet the needs of, of their patients. And there's nothing right now in law that really requires or for forces collaboration. That happens anyhow, that when you have a patient and their needs exceed what you can do or exceeds your scope, you refer to a physician, you refer them to a specialist and, and nurse practitioners, APRNs will continue to do that after this, this legislation passes and they'll continue to work collaboratively with physicians. And, and that's just how healthcare works. 
Um, but it, but it's really important to note that that what we have in place now isn't really mandating or requiring collaborative care. Your license and your scope of practice as an APRN already requires you to collaborate and refer when appropriate for your patient. And I would say nationally, there certainly are physicians that support this move across the states. Um, I have seen physicians come and you know, present at health committees on this topic, as well as write letters of support. So it's not all physicians are against this. Um, certainly there are some that are, um, but this is again, as Erin said, healthcare is a very collaborative environment in general. It's a team based activity <laughs> or work, and it requires everyone to have a role um, and the tasks that they're assigned to do. And this uh, removing this contract doesn't change necessarily what they're doing, the nurse practitioners are doing, it allows for them to not have to pay a physician for a monthly meeting <laughs> as a necessary contract. Um, it doesn't prevent them from calling their physician colleagues or friends uh, to ask for advice or information or to refer their patients to a physician when it is uh, a problem or something that they feel like might be more suitable for a physician colleague. So, and I know nurses are very, nurse practitioners are very good at that, recognizing their limitations and recognizing what their scope is. And physicians, you know, they are, again, as we talked about earlier, their knowledge and expertise is growing as science grows and technology is changing. And they we really need them working in the area that best suits their knowledge and expertise. And so allowing for this place for nurse practitioners to do this focused area of healthcare improves access both to, the, to just general access, but improves access to those physicians in that special area that they are working in as well. I think that's a great way to end this. Um, does anyone else have any final remarks that they wanna make before we say goodbye to everybody? All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I know it's tough we know none of us can all see each other and we can't actually provide you food these days. I would love to just like ship it in for you guys for food for thoughts, but I don't think the ethics commission has decided that's okay yet. <laughs> so we're really, um, but we're really excited to get to talk about this issue. We think there's a great opportunity this session to improve access to care for Texans, especially with this crisis. And we definitely don't think we should wait for another crisis to address this problem. So thank you again for joining us and thank you, Aaron, Amy and Blake for participating today. Um, and we will make this video available and we'll make Amy and Aaron's slides available for everyone at the Capitol also. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.